The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, for the first time, This Is Your FBI is being presented before an audience. It comes to you from the huge ballroom of the convention hall in Atlantic City, where 6,000 New Jersey teachers who are attending the 92nd annual convention of the New Jersey Education Association will watch the production. These teachers have chosen This Is Your FBI as an outstanding example of how an interesting and exciting radio drama can also serve the public welfare. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this special message from Mr. George F. Ashby, president of the Union Pacific Railroad Company. Mr. Ashby says, and I quote, Our group life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society has lessened the effects of disaster in the homes of thousands of our employees. Many of them have no other protection or an inadequate amount. Our own satisfaction is matched by the satisfaction expressed by employees and their families who since 1917 have received almost $20 million from group insurance. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 15 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance, which will interest both employers and employees. Tonight's FBI file, The Frightened Fugitive. When Japan surrendered more than a year ago, America breathed a collective sigh of relief. A great period of tribulation was ended. But victory in the war did not automatically solve all of the nation's problems on the home front. Today, the country is faced with mighty and difficult tasks. And perhaps the number one problem concerns the next generation, the young men and women who must be the leaders of America tomorrow. No child is born to be a criminal. And if he becomes one, it is for a variety of reasons. And it is up to us to see to it that our children are not confronted with the opportunity to become criminals. For we owe it to the future of the nation to see to it that this younger generation is not a lost generation. Tonight's file opens in a small town located on the eastern seaboard. Two boys, their high school classes finished for the day, are walking along a tree-shaded street. Hey, hold it a minute, Smitty. Huh? I want to ditch this cigarette. What for? Uh, my sister's been coming home from work early these past few days. I don't want her to see me smoking. There. She's really got the sign on you, ain't she? What do you mean? You're scared of her. I am not. Then why you let her run everything you do? Oh, it just saves fight, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I do anything I please. Like what? Well, like hanging out with you, for instance. You told me not to. But I do it anyway. (laughs) And behind her back, you do it. That ain't so. Is she home now? Yeah, I think so. Why don't you ask me to come in your house with you? Let's uh, see how she takes it. Look. Well? Smitty, we want to go to the dance tonight, don't we? We want to use her car. Yeah. Then let's not do anything to spoil that, huh? Okay, sucker. Now, wait. You got no right Come on in the house. I'll see you later. Smitty! Call for me at 8 o'clock. Oh... Yes, sir. Would you come in here to the living room, please? I gotta go upstairs. Jack, come in here. I want to talk to you. Okay. 
What is it? Sit down. Now, you're not going to start another Please lecture. Please sit down. Oh. Well. Jack, as you know, I've tried for the last two years to be mother, father, everything to you. Of course, I've had to work. I've left you alone a lot. But until recently, I thought it turned out pretty well. Well, it has. Now I know that it hasn't. That I failed. Ah, oh, sis, what is this? Joe, the past few weeks, I've been missing money. Small sums. Are you trying to say that yes, I was... Yes, Jack. You took that money. I've heard enough. Just stay where you are. Now listen to me. I know that you're not a thief. I know that basically you're honest and good, but ever since you and that boy Smitty... I'll leave him out of this. I won't. He's not good for you. Can't you see that? You were never like this until you met him. I promised you once I'd quit seeing the guy. You broke that promise. Oh, sis, you're crazy. He just left you in front of the house. I saw him. Look, can I help it if he walks down the same street with me? Jack, how can I make you listen to reason? By leaving me alone. Where are you going? Upstairs to press my clothes. What for? For the dance tonight. You're not going to that dance. But I promised the guys I'd pick him up. In my car? Well, yeah. No, you're not. But, sis, Jack, I... you're staying home. <laughs> What time is it, Smitty? Ah, almost quarter of nine. Well, we're going to be late. Yeah, can't this thing go any faster? How's that? Ah, that's better. Hey, what kept you? I thought you said you'd pick me up at eight o'clock. I had a stall around the house. Why? Uh, waiting for my sister to go out. I don't get it. She was making me stay home tonight. No kidding. What for? We had a fight. I wish she'd quit treating me like I was two years old or something. I told you before, it's your own fault, Jack. What do you mean? Tell her where she gets off once in a while, and she'll leave you alone. Well... That's how uh, I handle my old lady. I don't have no trouble with her at all. And we turn here, don't we? Yeah. Does your sister know you got a car? No. <laughs> she'll probably holler when she finds it gone, huh? No, I'm getting it back before she gets home. Hey, look out. Huh? Somebody's crossing the street right up ahead. Holy... I think we hit her. I'll take a look. Well, you hit her all right. What do we do? Put out your lights and let's get away from here fast. Can I come in, Chief? Well, I'll... Jim Taylor. <laughs> How are you? Just fine, Jim. Good to see you. Thanks. Hey, what are you doing out here in the sticks? Oh, I'm here at the special request of your Parent Teachers Association. What? Yes, they asked our field office to send an FBI agent to talk on juvenile delinquency, and I was given the assignment. Well, you couldn't have picked a better morning for your visit. What do you mean? I think I've got some business for you. Now, look, this was to be strictly a social call. It's an FBI case, Jim. Well, you police chiefs are alike. Well, what is it? Hit and run accident. An elderly woman was run down by a car early last night. Huh? What makes this an FBI case, Chief? Well, it looks as if it's a case of transporting a stolen car across the state line. We're right on the border, you know, Jim. Yes. Well, that would put it under our jurisdiction. Tell me, was the victim killed? No, she's still alive. Not in very good shape, though. Conscious? Not from the last report. What are the rest of the details? We have one witness, a man named Benton. He saw the whole thing. Did he get the license number? No. As the car pulled away, they put out the lights. Well, that usually happens. We know it was a coupe. Have you any idea what make? No, none at all. The victims in the local hospital? Mm-hmm. What about a clothing? It's being sent down here to headquarters. Good. Now, will you get it to our laboratory in Washington and have it examined for fragments of glass from the headlights and chips of paint from the fenders? Right. So, oh, uh, we have one other lead, Jim. What's that? This man, Benton, is pretty sure that he saw two boys in the car. Could he identify them? No, he said he couldn't. Well, I've got to get over to the school now. While I'm there, I'll give the details on this accident to the principal. He might be able to help us. I'll come right back here as soon as the meeting is over. Hey, Jack. Well, I've been looking all over for you, Smitty. Let's go around back of the gym. Okay. Were you in assembly? Yeah. Then you heard what the principal said. About the accident? Yeah, I heard him. What are we going to do? What do you mean? The cops know there were two guys our age in the car. So what? Well, they're bound to find out it was us. How? 
Well, the... look, if they knew who it was, the principal wouldn't have made that big speech about why didn't the guilty parties confess. Yeah, but... Jack, there's a thousand guys in the school. Any one of them could have done it. So how they not pick on us? I still wish we hadn't run away. What? I mean it, Smitty. We'd be in jail right now if we hadn't. We're liable to be there anyway. By running away, we might stay there twice as long. Stop it, will you? I can't help feeling that way, Smitty. Honest, I'm scared. Look, you haven't any ideas about squealing, have you? Have you? Come on, we got to get back to class. That's a my question. Smitty, I'll meet you after school. to come in, Chief? Oh, yes, Jim. Please do. Any developments on the accident? Well, the victim's clothing came in right after you left. One of my men took them into Washington. To our laboratory? Yeah. Good. We're waiting for a report now. Fine. Oh, uh, how'd the speech go? Well, I, I did my usual fumbling and stumbling. <laughs> the audience was very patient. Did you talk to the principal? Yes, I did. He was very cooperative. He called all the pupils into assembly and asked the drivers of the car to identify themselves, to admit their guilt. Any results? No. None of them admitted it. Oh, excuse me. Steve Gallagher speaking. Yes. Yes, he's right here. Uh, just a minute. For you, Jim. I think it's your office. Oh, fine. Here you are. Thanks. Baylor speaking. Oh, hello, Bob. Oh, good. Let's have it. Hmm. I see. I'm to stay down here? Fine. Well, I'll be in touch with you later. Goodbye. That was the report from the laboratory, Chief. On the car? Yes. It was a 1939 green Chevrolet Coupe. I see. Well, I've already alerted all service stations and garages in the vicinity to watch out for any car with a broken headlight or suspicious dents in the fender. Now I can tell them the make. And it might be a good idea, Chief, to call the State License Bureau and get a list of all 1939 Chevy Coupes that are registered within a 50-mile radius. Just a minute. Hi, Jack. Oh, hello, Smitty. I thought you were going to meet me after school. Well, I... I want to talk to you. Now, wait. Look, Smitty, my sister's liable to come home any minute. So what? I don't want her to find you here. Well, this is more important. Now, what's going on with you? What do you mean? That talk you were giving me this afternoon about being scared. I can't help it. I am scared. Scared enough to squeal? Well... Yeah, better not be if you know what's good for you. Wait. What's the matter? My sister's coming up the wall. So what? She mustn't see you here. Look, get in the closet there, will you, Smitty? I'll maneuver her upstairs and you beat it. Okay. Oh, get in there. Hiya, sis. Well, I'm glad you're home, Jack. Come into the living room. Oh, now, look. This you... is very serious. Okay. I want you to look at something. What? A story in today's paper. Here, read it. What's this all about? It's an account of a hit-and-run accident that happened last night. Two boys ran down an elderly woman. They were driving a coupe. Why should that interest me? Because that was my car and you were driving it. What? I have proof, Jack. Are you crazy? In the first place, you didn't stay home last night as you were told to do. That's a... I know you didn't, Jack. One of the neighbors saw you leave right after I did. You took my car. Okay. So I went to the dance. So what? I just examined my car. There are dents in the fender. One of the headlights is broken. And there are spots on the bumper that look like blood. Blood? You're lying. Come out and see for yourself. No. Jack, the police are looking for the hit-and-run driver. I know you did it. Leave me alone. Now, are you going to tell them or shall I? Neither one of you are telling them. Smitty! How did you get in here? I've been here all along. I heard the whole thing. Fine sister you are. You were with Jack, weren't you? That's right. Then you're both going to the police. Huh. Don't make me laugh. You've got to. And wind up spending half our lives in jail, not me. He's right, sis. They'd send us away for keeps. Not if you confess. They're bound to be lenient. But if you try to hide it, they will be severe. We ain't telling nothing. Very well, then. I'm calling the police. Keep away from that. Oh, phone. no. Put it down, I said. <laughs> Smitty. Come on. Let's get out of here. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes national security. 
Now let's hear from a typical American who has attained greater personal security thanks to his employer's cooperation and the Equitable Society. When my company signed up for a complete group insurance protection, it really took a load off my mind, Mr. Cross. Well, it should. You get life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income, plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children, all in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And no medical examination either. What I can't get over is how little that package costs. How is that possible? Because your employer plays a part of the cost. And because there are so many of you, the Equitable Society can sell it to you at what you might call the wholesale price. Well, it certainly was a godsend for a girlfriend of mine. Just two weeks after our group insurance started, her husband died of a heart attack. She wouldn't be able to manage if it wasn't for those checks from the Equitable Society. They'll continue her husband's pay envelope for more than a year. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, says group insurance is the most inspiring life insurance development of our time. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Frightened Fugitives. Sometimes a first offender will commit a crime which, while it cannot be condoned, can be understood. But by running away, he compounds the felony. The law is not without mercy. And if the first offender who commits a crime because he hasn't the moral strength to resist would realize that fact, there would be fewer hardened criminals. Criminals who go on from their first to their second, their third, their fourth crimes to a career of living beyond the law. What those young men do not realize, as proven by tonight's case from the files of your FBI is that crime is not a career, but merely a shortcut to living in prison. Tonight's file continues later the same evening at local police headquarters. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is sitting with Chief of Police Gallagher in his office as the telephone rings. Chief Gallagher? Yes? Send her right in. Hmm. This may be something, Jim. What is it, Chief? A young lady wants to see me. She says she has some information on the hit-and-run case. Well, I hope it's good. Yeah, sit so away. Come in. Well, how do you do? Good evening. My name is Wilson. Betty Wilson. Hello, Miss Wilson. This is Mr. Taylor. He's a special agent of the FBI. How do you do? Miss Wilson. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, uh, what have you got for us? Well... It's about that hit-and-run accident last night. Yes? My... My brother's the one you're looking for. Your brother? Miss, may we have the whole story, please? Well, he was in my car. He and the boy called Smitty. They were on their way to a dance when the accident happened. Did he tell you about the accident when he came home? No, he didn't. Well, then how did you find out? He used the car without my permission. I didn't know he had it. Today, when I read the story in the paper about two boys being involved, something made me feel that... Well, anyway, I examined my car. I knew there'd been an accident. You have a 1939 green Chevrolet coupe? Yes, how did you know? Our laboratory determined that from the flecks of paint that were found on the victim's clothing. Did your brother admit his guilt? Practically, yes. Mm-hmm. Where is he now? I have no idea. That's why I came here. What do you mean, Miss Wilson? I tried to make him give himself up, but this other boy, this Smitty, talked him out of it. Yes, go on. I decided to call the police anyway. But when I went to the phone, Smitty... Well, he hit me. I don't know how long I was unconscious. When I came to, they were gone. 
Uh, where does this Smitty live? On Elm Street. I called his home just before I came here. He'd been there and gone. He's probably run away, Chief. Yeah. How long ago did this happen, Miss Wilson? About three hours ago. Will you please give us a description of both boys? We'll put an alarm out on them at once. <laughs> Jack, this ain't bad. Huh? Having a room all to ourselves? It ain't much of a room. What do you want for a buck a day? A palace? It's a good hideaway. That's all we care about. Yeah, I suppose so. Quit moping, will you? We're really living, kid. Some living. Why don't you stop? I can't help it, Smitty. I feel awful. What about? You had no right hitting my sister. What else could I do? She's going to turn us over to the cops. But you didn't have to stop her that way. Look... Why don't you grow up? I just wish none of this had ever happened. Smitty, what are we going to do? What do you mean? Well, we can't stay here in this room and house forever. I told you it's a good hideaway. We're 50 miles from home. We'll stay here till they quit looking for us. Then we'll start out on our own. Doing what? How much, uh, how much dough did you take from your sister's purse? 35 bucks. Okay, let me have what you got left. What for? For our new career. Huh? I'm going out and buy a gun. Well, Jim, I think we're getting some action. What have you got? One of my men just called in from the bus station. Yes? Two boys answering the description of young Wilson and his pal Smith took a bus to Centerville over three hours ago. I see. I have notified the police up there to be on the lookout for them. Well, that bus has already arrived there by now, hasn't it? Yes, the trip is less than two hours. Well, that eliminates any chance of picking them up as they get off. Uh, no. Oh, excuse me. Sitting around. Chief Gallagher. Oh, hello, Miss Wilson. When was this? I see. He didn't say where he, say where he was. Uh-huh. Well, we'll get to work on it. Thank you. Young Wilson just called his sister. Said he was sorry about what happened. But he didn't say where he was calling from. No, but it was a long-distance call. We can have it traced. You, Smitty? Yeah. Hello, Jack. Who are you? A friend of yours. I'd like to come in and talk to you. Oh, wait a minute. What is this? My name is Taylor, son. I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? That's right. Well, what are you doing here? I told you. I came to talk to you. About that hit and run accident you and your pal Smitty were involved in. I don't know what you're talking now, about. Now, look, son, we know you were driving that car. That ain't so. Get out of here, will you? Your sister told us the whole story. She was lying. Oh, no. She was the one that sent you here, wasn't she? We traced the phone call you made to her from this house, but that isn't important. There are any number of ways to find you. You see, Jack, it isn't easy to escape the law. <laughs> well, you were driving that car, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Right from the beginning, I wanted to tell. Honest, I did. Would have been a lot easier, Jack. How's my sister? She's all right. Where's your friend, Smitty? He went out. Is he coming back? Yeah, but don't let him know I told you. He'll be... Oh, Jack, I got the... Uh, who was this guy? He's from the FBI. You have been shooting your mouth off. He didn't have to, Smitty. I know all about both of you. Oh, is that a fact? Yes. Chief of police from your hometown came up here with me to get you and bring you both back home. He's down at headquarters waiting for us. All right, let's go. You ain't taking us no place. Smitty. Where did you get that gun? I just bought it. And if you don't stay where you are, I'm using it on you. Smitty, put that away. I'll handle this, Jack. Oh, no, he's got us in enough trouble. Look out. Oh. I owed him that one. I understand, Jack. I think your sister will, too. Come on, boys. Jack Wilson and Walter Smith were both tried and convicted. And upon their convictions were sent to the state reformatory to be held there until they reached the age of 21. Tonight, 
This is your FBI was presented before an audience of 6,000 New Jersey teachers attending the 92nd Annual Convention of the New Jersey Education Association at Convention Hall in Atlantic City. To these 6,000 teachers, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has sent a message. His message is also directed to every other school teacher and to every parent in the United States. Here is Mr. Hoover's message, brought to you by Special Agent Jim Taylor. The teachers of America occupy a strategic position in our never-ending fight for better citizenship. The discharge of their responsibilities is far from easy. Too often, they do not have the backing and support due them from the parents of America. One of the tragedies in our national life is our policy of being penny-wise and pound-foolish when we consider our schools and community services. It is not a pleasant thought that the average school teacher is underpaid. When we realize that there are seven persons in the United States who have been arrested for every school teacher in classrooms, and when the potential criminal army is ten times larger than the students in our colleges and universities, then we should know that the price of better education is cheap indeed if it succeeds, as it can, in cutting our national crime bill. The school teachers have within their power the development of better citizens, and I urge that every parent give them the support they need to do the job. We of the FBI look to the teachers of America as allies in our fight to curb the rising wave of crime. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder by Accident. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. It's written and produced by Jerry Devine. Now, this is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation on This Is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>